So, welcome here to our seminar, webinar, uh, with Peter Margolis, who I will introduce just shortly. We have a tagline, which is how we found the lead users and why that was extremely important. Um, we will have a lunch webinar with a 20 minutes of presentation and then hopefully a fruitful discussion afterwards. Um, we will meet Peter Margolis. He is a pediatrician. He is a research professor uh, with a PhD in epidemio epidemiology. Uh, he's working at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, Medical Center in the US and uh, in 2006, he started to create a new center focused on healthcare quality. He is leading the C3N project. It is an NIH roadmap transformative research grant on uh, redesigning systems for chronic illness care. And uh, to my mind, I will be your moderator here. Um, to my mind, this is a learning session, especially uh, for us to hear about a collaborative network of providers, healthcare providers, professionals, different professionals, patients and researchers. And it is about quality improvement in healthcare and about service and systems design. So for me, it's very exciting to introduce to you Peter Margolis, and I hope that you will send in questions over Twitter. This is the hashtag. Uh, we have a microphone in the room, so you can ask questions after the presentation. And uh, I hope we'll have some fun and learn something together. Peter, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, it's, uh, it's exciting to uh, use the technology to give this presentation to everyone. Uh, and so uh, it's nice to see you um, virtually from uh, Cincinnati. Uh, so Andreas asked me to talk about this uh, research project uh, and uh, that we call the a collaborative chronic care project uh, network project as he mentioned this is a uh, this work is funded by uh, the NIH uh, director's office um, and it's aimed at uh, that funding was aimed at supporting uh, new scientific approaches that were would result in non incremental changes um, uh, in uh, specific fields so uh, what I'd like to do is to introduce you to the way we think about the project and also emphasize um, some of the ways in which we've been using design uh, to uh, undertake the project. So when we talk about this work of uh, transforming systems of chronic illness care for children, um, we start by thinking about the uh, participants in the system. And so uh, this is a picture of... Uh, uh, system user or uh, what we call a persona uh, named Bianca. She's 11 years old. She's obviously in uh, quite a bit of pain, uh, but that's not the least of her problems. The reason why she's in pain is that she has Crohn's disease. Uh, and as a result, she stands about a 30% chance of undergoing surgery in the next uh, three years, uh, a significant risk of uh, arthritis, of stunted growth, uh, of chronic uh, abdominal pain um, and uh, undertaking normal childhood activities like sleepovers, uh, sleeping over at her friend's house or going to the mall can be quite a challenge. This is another user of the system. We call her Dr. Sandy Roan. Um, 
she's uh, interested in uh, delivering the best possible care for her patients, but the evidence about um, the best treatments comes from uh, randomized clinical trials, and uh, these may or may not be uh, applicable to uh, uh, individual uh, patients. Uh, often the results are hard to apply to individual patients because the trial provides uh, evidence of effectiveness on average, but uh, for individuals, specific individuals, uh, may not be applicable. This is a picture of uh, Bianca's mother. We call her Anna, and uh, she's interested in making sure that uh, uh, her daughter gets the best care, but she thinks it's the doctor's responsibility to um, identify what the right thing is to do. She doesn't always imagine the participatory uh, opportunities. And finally, the last participant in the system is who we call Dr. Vincent Kapoor. He's a young researcher interested in studying inflammatory bowel diseases, but he's confronted with small, uh, unrepresentative um, sets of data uh, and uh, often a lack of collaboration in order to, um, that can increase the impact of his research. So when we started uh, developing the, uh, this project, we thought about the uh, current system uh, uh, or current, what we call the current paradigm of chronic illness care, which is structured around episodic visits to the doctor and one-on-one -on -one interactions with uh, the physician um, that are synchronous, that they take place face-to-face. -face. There are limited ways for patients to participate and an inherent uh, difference of power that's based on um, uh, a knowledge gradient uh, between patients and doctors. There are uh, existing uh, networks of, um, of uh, patients who uh, go online and communicate about their disease. There are networks of clinicians who work together uh, as part of professional organizations, and there are networks of researchers who um, also uh, collaborate uh, in their research societies, but these networks are relatively uh, isolated. So when we developed this project, we, we wondered what if we could create a vastly better system of chronic illness care by harnessing the inherent motivation and collective intelligence of patients and clinicians? And what if this system allowed patients and physicians to share information, to collaborate, to solve problems? and use their collective creativity and expertise to act in ways that would improve health. Um, Yokai Benkler, who is a, a law professor at the Harvard uh, uh, Center for Society and the Internet, calls this form of collaboration a uh, network-based production, and we're very familiar with it in many other industries uh, uh, such, uh, and fields, the uh, concept of Wikipedia or TripAdvisor or in science, uh, uh, the sharing of data among uh, scientists in the Human Genome Project dramatically accelerated the acquisition of new knowledge, um, resulting in the Human Genome Project in the project being concluded uh, a number of years in advance of schedule. But these models have not yet been applied uh, widely in healthcare. Uh, so uh, we imagine a collaborative chronic care network, or what we call a C3N, as a network-based production system for health and healthcare, in which interactions can be more continuous and asynchronous, in which pa uh, patients and providers are empowered to affect the discovery and production process, and that in which there's an ecosystem of patients and providers and researchers all on the same uh, networking platform, if you will, who use technology uh, to enable people to gracefully change their behavior in the course of daily life. So that was our design challenge uh, that we presented to the NIH in our original grant application. Um, these ideas may seem uh, uh, somewhat unusual, but in, in some ways they're actually taking place already. Um, uh, Physicians are already uh, collaborating. Um, let me tell you about one example. Uh, this uh, group uh, that we work with as part of this project is called uh, the Improved Care Now Network. This is a network of uh, pediatric gastroenterologists um, who have uh, began working together in 2007 uh, to try to improve the outcomes of their patients. And what is shown here 
is a graph of the percent of uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease whose disease is in remission. In other words, uh, they can go about living, uh, uh, they can, in the, in, in the words of a patient, uh, I can forget about uh, uh, my disease and get on with my life. Uh, so uh, beginning in 2007, uh, uh, doctors from uh, not initially about nine centers started to work together, sharing knowledge, sharing know-how, and sharing the work of improving care. And as you can see here, the rate of uh, the percentage of patients in remission has increased from about sixty percent to uh, currently about seventy-seven percent. Um, and this is in the context of no improvement in outcomes in this disease in the last. Uh, several decades and no new medications. This is uh, improvement that came about by applying principles of quality improvement to work. Currently, the network includes 52 care sites, uh, over 425 physicians, uh, several thousand staff, 16,000 patients, and there's a widespread use of uh, standardized care. So this was the network of physicians that we uh, uh, began to work with, and uh, our challenge was to uh, at bring together um, uh, researchers and patients as part of the same effort. So it, we have been focusing on four different ways, uh, four different activities in creating this network-based system to uh, produce health. Uh, it, a focus on the outcome, a focus on building community, uh, effective use of technology, and a system for learning that includes a variety of different scientific approaches uh, including uh, complex system science, quality improvement, qual qualitative research, and clinical research methods. Uh, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about the way that we approach the design of this network. Uh, our our uh, thought was to bring together several different uh, design uh, activities, uh, one of which uh, we call idealized design. It's a, a process based on uh, quality improvement principles. Uh, the second was uh, uh, design research to identify um, uh, user goals, and the last was uh, environmental scanning uh, to look for ideas. Um, really, what we would call uh, user-led uh, network-based innovation, and the, uh, we have colleagues at Procter & Gamble, which is located in Cincinnati, who uh, call this uh, Look Everywhere Now. So um, this is the idealized design process. Um, uh, the concept is that uh, when we're uh, approaching a, a problem, uh, there are a series of design steps that um, begin with uh, uh, understanding the user needs, uh, identifying uh, new ideas, uh, uh, screening the ideas, and synthesizing them to create a series of prototypes which are then tested and then uh, progressively scaled up through pilot testing uh, to bring them to full implementation. And today what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, where we are in that process. So let me just show you an example of some of the uh, early design work that we did. This is uh, uh, someone, uh, pr again, a user that we call her Bianca Simmons. Uh, she's uh, 20 years of age. and. Um, this uh, this persona emerged from a series of interviews with children and families and uh, uh, children and their uh, families uh, that described the experience uh, of uh, patients as they uh, uh, go through life with this disease and uh, the the purpose is to really understand their goals. Um, uh, this particular persona, Bianca, uh, is uh, someone who has lived 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 with the disease and come to uh, uh, get some insights and uh, her desire is to become a leader in the I IBD community and give back. So we, and this was an important finding from our ethnographic research because the individuals like Bianca represent uh, the lead users. We also uh, collaborated with a colleague named Peter Glor from the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. He's a Swiss uh, computer scientist who's interested in the uh, use of uh, the internet to uh, 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 crowd uh, to crowdsource uh, problems. Uh, so uh, he used a tool that he's developed to um, map the online social network of patients with Crohn's disease on Facebook, uh, and that's what this uh, photograph, uh, this was, this image shows. As you can see on uh, on this image, 
there are um, uh, th uh, there are small clusters of uh, people in almost a starburst pattern um, that uh, emanate out from the beginning. And unlike other social networks, each one of the little there's a little node that has a like little uh, roots from a tree uh, coming off of it. Uh, those those nodes are not connected with each other, emphasizing uh, a key finding of the ethnographic research that uh, patients with disease are quite isolated in a, any given school. There may be only one child um, with uh, Crohn's disease and uh, discussing going to the bathroom all the time is not something that you want to do with your friends. We also identified uh, patients who actually uh, represented what we anticipate anticipated in uh, in the design research. This is a photograph of uh, a, a young woman named Jill Plavinsky. She's uh, currently a, uh, when she started working with us in 2009 uh, designing this program uh, to, uh, to join the design team, she was a college student. Uh, she currently chairs our patient advisory uh, council. We call her, we call that the PAC. And these are the reasons why she um, told us that she liked to participate in uh, the design work. Um, uh, and as you can see, many of these uh, many of these uh, comments represent uh, the concepts that emerged from the ethnographic uh, research. And our goal was to engage lead users like Jill in uh, the design of the network. So this was the design process. It will be very familiar to uh, all of you. Um, we undertook ethnographic research. Um, the, the two starting points were ethnographic research to understand the needs of the users, and then the creation of what we call the collaborative innovation network. We brought together the co-investigators on this project uh, include uh, physicians, uh, patients, uh, we have computer scientists from the MIT Media Lab and the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. There are sociologists from the University of uh, Chicago. There are health policy experts from UCLA uh, uh, and uh, uh, communications uh, experts. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the people who is participating is uh, someone named Jesse Dillon. That's Bob's son. Uh, he's a, a film director in Hollywood, and his uh, he is he has a a team of designers who work with him at an organization called Libba, uh, and we engaged him uh, in uh, helping us. So uh, building on that network that had quite a diverse uh, uh, set of expertise, we started to uh, scan the environment and generate ideas for approaches uh, that we could incorporate into the project. So there were obviously quite a few technology approaches, the concept of using Facebook, of creating applications for telephones. Um, and really leveraging uh, social media. But there were also um, uh, social uh, interventions uh, uh, that we imagined. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the United Farm Workers movement in the 60s. We connected with someone named uh, Marshall Gans. He's currently a professor at the Harvard School of uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Public Policy, and he was Cesar Chavez's community organizer. Uh, he also has is the primary community organizer b behind uh, the Obama campaign, and uh, and uh, he, we uh, wanted to learn from him about how to organize a very large community of patients and clinicians and researchers working together. Big Brothers and Big Sisters is a mentoring program in the U.S. Uh, we we're interested in the concept of mentoring because of the potential of. Uh, uh, empowering patients and uh, engaging them and sharing their ideas. Uh, finally, uh, uh, we had a, uh, we imagined examples like uh, TED talks um, to uh, consolidate information and making it make it widely available. So all of this came together and and resulted in uh, what I will show next, which is a picture of our very first design. These as we came up with ideas, this is a wall in our office. Um, which we put uh, post-it notes and drawings uh, on the wall to start to organize our ideas. Ultimately, this resulted in a uh, logic diagram on which uh, is shown uh, on the next slide, if it loads, there it goes, uh, which relates uh, the outcomes that we were uh, trying to, to achieve to uh, various uh, uh, intervention approaches uh, uh, we had about we generated about 120 different ideas for improving uh, uh, care, and, and then went through a um, rating exercise to rate 
uh, both each um, idea on the, how much uh, we knew about uh, that idea, how much, uh, uh, how much we knew about it and the, its potential for impact. So we selected to put into prototyping uh, ideas that uh, we thought could have a lot of impact, but we didn't know how to make them work. Um, the, those were good candidates for prototypes. And uh, this resulted in about uh, 19 uh, prototypes that we're currently that we currently have uh, in, in uh, development across the network. And I'll give you some examples of those next. So um, through this process, um, we ended up uh, as of uh, last month with about 100 to 150 contributors around the world. Uh, in fact, Andreas uh, found us through our process of publicizing the work that we are doing and uh, 19 innovation teams. Uh, this is the this is the uh, beginnings of what we think is the the network uh, of production. So uh, one of the areas in that we're very interested in is the use of technology and the capturing of information from electronic medical records. Uh, at present, uh, the, uh, when we began the project, uh, physicians would enter data into the electronic medical record, uh, then uh, print out a, a printout of the screens, and then give the give the printout to a research assistant who would enter it into our large database. Uh, we are currently making a transition uh, to what we call a data in one system in which physicians enter data into the EMR and those data are uploaded into uh, the registry. This takes place uh, through uh, special forms that uh, several of the electronic medical record vendors have created. So, and that's what this photograph shows. It's a picture of the electronic medical record for a, a patient with Crohn's disease. Uh, once the data are in the in the electronic medical record, we can reuse them to enable make it easier for physicians to undertake some of the chronic care uh, processes that they need to do, like uh, planning for uh, patients' visits. This is an automated uh, what we call pre-visit planning or visit planning tool that physicians use prior to a, a patient's uh, coming to the uh, clinic. It reviews the guidelines for care and uh, has reminders. Uh, that physicians can use to uh, make sure that each patient is getting the care that they need. This is a, a picture of uh, a screenshot of some of the data that each of the centers receives uh, showing their uh, performance on uh, 17 different measures of quality uh, on a monthly basis and the centers uh, get this report and they can compare their, their performance to other centers. We're also able to repurpose and reuse the data for comparative effectiveness research. So up until the time that uh, we began this work, there were no trials uh, uh, of the uh, most uh, of the uh, most um, uh, intensive form of therapy uh, that are, is used uh, for children with the disease. It's called uh, biologic therapies or immuno, uh, such as uh, Remicade or Infliximab. Um, the previous trials had been done in, in adults and it was thought to be unethical to uh, conduct these trials in children. This is a problem that we typically have in uh, pediatrics. So with the very large database, we've been able to uh, undertake uh, uh, and uh, simulate trials uh, comparing children who are uh, treated by their physicians uh, using uh, biologic medications uh, compared to other medications and their, thereby estimate um, the effectiveness of treatment. And that's what this slide shows. Um, the blue line is the uh, treatment effects uh, percentage of patients in remission uh, uh, of patients on uh, infliximab. The red line is patients being treated with other therapies. Finally, we can reuse the data to undertake uh, individualized trials. So uh, these are data, uh, daily data from a 19-year-old who has Crohn's colitis. She had a colectomy, her uh, colon was taken out, and she was bothered by uh, chronic diarrhea and going to the bathroom uh, at night. It made her exhausted because she would get up uh, five or six times a night. Um, and uh, she was interested in undertaking an experiment with her own doctor to uh, identify what uh, would whether there were other things that she could do to get her symptoms under control. So what you can see here on the y-axis is the 
uh, number of stools uh, that she has per night, and on the x-axis is date. And um, there are, uh, so she started, we set up, using the registry, we've been able to set up a daily data collection system using SMS texting. And she uh, noticed that sh there were several uh, time periods when uh, her, uh, the number of bowel movements that she had uh, was uh, significantly reduced. And when she pointed this out to her doctor, she had forgotten uh, that she was taking uh, antibiotics for uh, sinusitis. Um, and uh, this happened twice, and it led her doctor to prescribe. That's a known uh, uh, cause. Uh, uh, bacterial overgrowth in the intestines is a known cause of, of um, uh, chronic diarrhea. And so uh, this led her doctor to prescribe, change his treatment of her. Um, so it, again, this example shows the reuse data in one system and reuse of data for multiple different purposes. We also have considerable work going on to engage patients and families in care. Uh, we call this the social platform for uh, the project. Uh, patients are involved in the design. They're involved in the leadership of the network at a variety of different levels. They're on the board of directors. They're um, on uh, the research committees. Uh, they are uh, part of each of the center, participating centers, QI teams. They're, they participate in co-developing innovations. Um, they contribute their data. Um, and I just want to show some examples uh, of how we think about patients and families as co-producers, uh, really in four different categories, in, uh, contributing information and insight, and contributing how-to knowledge and spawning innovations and providing emotional support. We're currently working at one of our collaborators is a um, startup uh, company uh, that's been started by the previous, the former uh, chief health strategist of Google named Ronnie Zeger and uh, Gilles Friedman, who is a patient activist who runs a very large um, online network of cancer patients, 100,000 people. Uh, they've just started a new uh, software platform called Smart Patients that enables patients to contribute uh, information and insights uh, to each other uh, online in very well moderated and extremely sophisticated and helpful level of information. Uh, to uh, that patients share with one another. Uh, groups of parents and patients at each of the care centers are beginning to create mentoring, parent-to-parent -parent mentoring programs. They create hospital care kits. Uh, they've created resource libraries, newsletters, uh, what they call an onboarding kit or an introductory kit for families who uh, are experiencing this disease. Some of the patients are creating educational videos about how to use particular medical treatments. They're organizing activities at uh, camp for kids and education days. We're also uh, designing new tools to make, make it easier for patients to understand uh, their laboratory uh, tests and also to uh, prepare for visits. This is a screenshot of uh, a, an automated report that uh, is uh, we're pi currently being uh, pilot tested. It's sent to patients about a week before their visit so they can understand um, the laboratory tests that they're on. And uh, this is a uh, design uh, screenshot that shows a concept that we're pilot testing called inner visit planning. Every week for six weeks prior to a visit, patients are uh, sent a survey um, uh, which asks them about their current level of symptoms and also questions that they may have. Uh, prior to the, uh, just a week prior to the visit, they get, as shown here, a dashboard that shows their changes in symptoms over time, their laboratory scores, and then a list of questions, a summary of the list of questions they had. This same information is sent to the doctors who use it during pre-visit planning um, to prepare for the visit so that everybody comes to uh, care delivery uh, prepared. So uh, in summary, um, what I've shown is uh, a, what we think of as a collaborative, uh, the Improve Care Now collaborative chronic care network in which clinical care improvement and research take part of a single system rather than three disparate systems that are focused on outcomes. There are four main elements, this focus on outcomes, the uh, building community, uh, the effective use of technology and a learning system that allows us to learn very rapidly uh, testing these prototypes and pilot ideas. Um, we uh, think that uh, this has been a very useful way to integrate the design principles, quality improvement, and 
uh, the use of uh, collaborative and innovation, and that these approaches have been pivotal in the uh, development in the network. So um, I will stop there and uh, see if anyone has any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Um, so we have uh, a microphone if you have questions here. Um, we have some communication over the internet. I would like to start off with asking you, Peter, you of course talk about this as one system and it's all very integrated, but if we were to talk a bit about design and uh, how that comes in, how has design emerged here and developed as part of your collaborative network? Um. So what's taking place now is uh, we started with a very small group of people. It was about uh, 17. There were about 17 to 25 people who participated in the original design coming up with these ideas. Uh, yeah, our goal was to grow that number to engage other people in contributing their ideas to uh, the ongoing design. We, what we wanted to do was to find the lead users. Um, and so currently what takes place is that we have our own ideas that we're pilot testing and developing, but uh, a variety of people uh, contact us on an ongoing basis pretty much every week. Um, uh, someone contacts us with an idea or some contribution that they want to make. Uh, the example that I showed of smart patients uh, took place because uh, of uh, of connections uh, to uh, some of our collaborators, um, we hadn't ever imagined. We had imagined the idea of a social network for patients, but we didn't know how to build it. And uh, lo and behold, someone just appeared. Ronnie Zeger appeared, and uh, we spawned a collaboration because he was looking for from his, what was he was looking for a lab in which he could test his ideas. And so that that was someone who was. Uh, some kind of a user or especially interested in a subject. He, he was not a patient or was he connected to no. a patient? He is a physician himself. He's interested in patients with cancer, but uh, he wanted to have a, he was looking for a, uh, uh, a group of physicians who could collaborate with him to uh, test out uh, this new system that he was developing. So, so users in your context is, that could be Patients and physicians are also a group of users. What, what more users do you have in your system? We also have, uh, well, so there are patients who, uh, one of the patients who's participating um, is somebody that by the name of Tanya Moon. She's at uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and she had the idea of parent-to-parent uh, -parent mentoring. And so she's joined the, uh, she meets with the care team every week um, and uh, has developed this program. And now several parents at Nationwide visit all children who have Crohn's disease who are admitted to the hospital. Um, they stop by and uh, meet with them to help them uh, with uh, issues about how to, how to live with this disease, how to talk to the schools about it so that kids can go to the bathroom when they need to. There are also researchers uh, who come to us with, uh, once they know that there's a database, they can, they are, there are numerous researchers who are coming interested in uh, uh, contributing. We recently had, um, and then there are entrepreneurs, we recently had a team of um, uh, business students from the Wharton School of uh, Business at the University of Pennsylvania who are very taken by this idea and have decided to use it as a class project to help us figure out how to make the network uh, sustainable from an economic perspective. So how you have a, a, you mentioned, you showed you have a design process for this. Uh, so is it the same design process for everything you do? Um, we, the, the design process itself uh, is, uh, is a pretty, it, it is our, we have, it is standardized. So uh, when we work with uh, new, uh, new teams or new individuals who come uh, to work with us, we generally go through this process uh, and uh, evaluate uh, new ideas through this series of stages. 
So, so you work together with designers. You mentioned this Bob Dylan son, who, who was a leader of, of a, a, a design group. How do you work together with the designers in practice? What, what do they bring to the table? So the designers have, uh, so Bob Dylan's son is an example of a lead user. He, uh, he, when he heard about our work, he had a, he has a child with Crohn's disease and, uh, uh he heard me giving a presentation about it. And, uh, as a filmmaker, he, um, he, he came up to me and he said, Peter, you know, um, it's a, it's fantastic work that you're doing, but you can't, you have to be able to tell the story of what you do in, uh, three or four minutes and let me make you a film to do that and he made a terrific film that uh, uh, we used to show doctors about why they should participate. He subsequently engaged, started a design group uh, and the designers do uh, uh, quite a bit of work. They do the ethnographic work um, and they were very instrumental in, uh, in uh, developing the original ideas for uh, the original 120 ideas um, and then uh, some, uh, they also work on developing the user interaction designs. Uh, this is, uh, this slide is uh, a product of the design team at Libba. Um, and so, uh, some of the early, uh, the very earliest prototypes are just sketches. And that's what this is. So as we get a new idea, they're often involved in taking the idea and, and if it involves a uh, user experience, uh, they'll help us develop both the technology parts of the user experience, but also the human parts of the user experience. So would you say that, that design thinking is becoming part of your culture in a way or? In, in this network, it's very much part of the culture. Everybody, uh, we, uh, we have a, we're constantly talking about where in the development we have about 20 different teams currently working uh, on uh, projects in different stages of uh, development and all of the teams use this way of uh, this, this way of thinking about their work. So how do they learn about this way to think about work and it's also perhaps a way to do work actual work or yes. So uh, they learn it. Uh, we uh, as part when uh, when uh, when groups join us, we uh, our project staff is all trained. We the leaders, the co-investigators, uh, essentially uh, we teach everybody who joins us to work in this way. And and what uh, do the doctors think? Uh, the doctors actually, it's been interesting. The doctors. Um, I think doctors have not been used to thinking about themselves as designers, um, although uh, <laughs> they, uh, they're they used to receiving uh, new products. But as it's it, when it, what we've observed is that the doctors have not appreciated the very conceptual level designs like what I'm showing on this slide. But as tools get a little bit more uh, refined and we are producing uh, the very first prototypes um, like these uh, applications that are still uh, fairly raw, uh, they get pretty excited about it and like to contribute their ideas. Um, and once they see that they can actually uh, get an, an early product, contribute their ideas, that spawns more ideas in them. You know, they go, oh, well, maybe what if we did this or what if we did that? And so then that uh, the doctors start to get pretty energized about making contributions. So in a way, you, you, come, you give them some kind of sense of a freedom to operate or to innovate. Is that... Would yes. That be way? Yes. Um, what, and what benefits do they, they get themselves from this? Uh, so they get to create, uh, the doctors are not happy with the, the way the care system operates. And so they're excited about the idea of, of being able to, um, uh, to do things differently. And so this is, a, the C3N is a, is a place and a group of people that they can talk to about that and, and try out new ideas. So there's a small team of doctors now who are doing these N of 1 experience, experiments, uh, uh, 
right now we have about five doctors who uh, really like this idea of having data on a daily basis from their patients. And so they're very actively recruiting patients. Um, and a lot of the design that they're doing with us is figuring out how to how to use this kind of information that doctors uh, have never had. Uh, we've had to rely on what patients tell us how, about how they've been feeling for the last three months when they come into a, a clinic visit. And with these kinds of data, uh, we can observe how a patient is doing on a daily basis, whether the medications that we're giving are actually working um, and producing improvement uh, very rapidly. And so that opens up all kinds of new um, ways that doctors can participate in. But uh, the way we're doing this is this is a this is a this is a pilot that's not ready to be deployed in the medical care system. The system it, we don't have technology to manage a thousand patients with this kind of data right now. And we don't have the care processes to be able to react to it. And so with a group of five doctors, uh, we can start to uncover the problems and then start to address them. It's uh, in software development, this would be called uh, agile uh, development. Can you elaborate a bit about how the patients have reacted to this, these, especially these patient activation tools? What, what do they say? What do they see? What do they think? The patients, uh, I mean, the patients are extremely excited. We, we are just now starting a pilot test of this, but in our prototypes, we were giving these kinds of reports to the designers developed this report uh, building on a design from uh, that was published in Wired magazine. Uh, and what this shows is a particular laboratory test. And at the on the left, it's a little description. You can't see it on your slide, but it's a little description of the kinds of what the laboratory test means. And then at the uh, underneath the green, uh, the there's a little box that shows changes over time. This is patients have told us in the in the design research that they don't understand the laboratory test, that they want to understand it. And so as we've given these um, mock-ups to patients, they love it. They, you know, they feel much more informed and much more prepared because they know, they know what the tests are and they know what questions they should be asking. Uh, and they can evaluate uh, the, their child's uh, change over time. So it seems you know, you know a lot about what doctors would like and once they get working with it they they love it but and then you say the patients reactions to these are perhaps even faster and quicker i i, I get a sense of would is is this um what what are the risks in in engaging patients patients in this ways when the systems are not really ready for change you said or that the systems are a bit, uh, yeah, they need another rhythm and pace perhaps in change. Yeah, uh, it's, so all of this work starts uh, small with a limited number of people. Uh, the network of clinicians gets together face to face, excuse me, twice a year. Um, uh, we just had a meeting this past weekend in Chicago, there were 180 uh, physicians and uh, clinical care teams, their nurses, uh, the research coordinators. And um, uh, we had about 20 patients participating. At the meeting, uh, we talk about how to improve care. Uh, the patients uh, came and participated in those discussions. They talked uh, and gave presentations to the group of 180 about what mattered to them. And uh, they observed the uh, performance data from each of the care sites. So it was completely transparent to the patients. Uh, that's a little bit risky. Doctors don't like to show, could be nervous about showing their performance to their patients. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the patients who were there um, talked about the importance of their role of providing a voice to the voiceless other patients. Uh, there were 20 patients there representing um, representing uh, 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 the 16,000 other patients who aren't at the meeting. It is, it is a little bit risky, and everybody feels, feels the risk, uh, but it's a risk that, they, uh, that the entire group wants to take in order to make uh, care better. 
because it's kind of inherent. Uh, you talk about the United Farm wor Workers. I mean, one could see a, a very strong reactions and a new strong demands. Wh what? But but you think can you manage this risk of and and uh, work with this patient engagement and activation to to balance it or? That's what we're hoping to learn to do. Um, we are using principles of designing the network that we're learning from people who have developed other large networks like uh, Wikipedia or Linux. Uh, it's a very uh, merit-based peer-reviewed system so that uh, there's an enormous amount of transparency uh, in the system. Uh, the patients and the doctors and the researchers can see the performance of each of the care centers. We know which care center is doing the best. Uh, we make that completely public. Um, colleagues look at the data to evaluate whether or not they believe that the data are accurate. The patients see it. Um, and uh, so when someone wants to introduce a new idea, we can evaluate the idea based on its impact on outcomes. And that's made transparent to everyone. So. Uh, so that produces a form of peer review, what we would call peer review in science, uh, uh, in a very authentic way. Um, and it also uh, emphasizes that the, uh, it places an emphasis on, it emphasizes what our value, the number one value we have, which is improving the outcomes for patients. So it is risky, um, but um, it's also self-correcting. So you you uh, probably in quality improvement it is very much about uh, uh, um, planning and 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 trying something and evaluating and then and then trying again and in in design uh, also about prototyping uh, seeing user needs have you do you have a feeling that the way your network works or your system works uh, helps doctors to become more um, experimentative, <laughs> in a way. We uh, that uh, that is what we're trying to do. It's a very cooperative group of physicians. Uh, I think one of the when um, when the physicians talk about what uh, what uh, they're getting out of this. Uh, they use the words, uh, they say that they've learned to uh, share seamlessly and to steal shamelessly. Um, so it's, uh, and uh, so they steal ideas from each other and then they test the ideas. We teach them to test the ideas in their practice. Um, uh, I think what makes them, what enables them to do that is that we reduce the risk of testing by instead of going to full scale implementation of any idea, we always ask them to test it on a very small scale with one or two patients or with one or two colleagues in order to evaluate whether or not the idea is suitable for their setting. And, and, and so that's built into the way we run the system. So if you were to elaborate a bit more on the linkages between quality improvement work and design work, how would you uh, sum that up a bit? Well, I, I, th I think uh, people often think of quality improvement as uh, an undertaking that uh, is in, aimed at fixing problems or incremental change. Uh, the, a part of quality improvement that's often ignored is the idea of uh, designing something completely new. And that's where there's an enormous interaction with uh, uh, sort of what uh, might be called design thinking. So especially in innovation. In innovation work. in particular, yes. Um, so if we were going to, to have a concrete example, if, if I was a father to, to a child in, in your system and I had this idea of an, a new app that... that uh, could be useful for for pre-visit planning, taking your idea of um, of what we learn in the everyday and then trying to prepare for the visits at at the clinics. How would that work? Where would I, I would I would probably be a lead user in your in your language if yes, I if I already I had learned something about creating an app and 
And then right. how how would that work in your system? Who would I talk to? Where what would happen? Well, in fact, uh, you know, as as you know, you you do fit that uh, criteria, and that's how you found us. <laughs> and uh, you happen to be working on a different disease, uh, but uh, for someone working on this disease. Uh, uh, in, in fact, we had uh, some patients at the University of Oklahoma who had the idea of a game to give to children uh, before, um, before a clinic visit to assess their understanding of nutrition. And uh, so they came to us uh, and said, uh, would it be okay if we develop this uh, game for patients with IBD? And um, they got some funding from a local uh, universe, from the local, un uh, uh, they got a class at the university uh, to design the game for them. And in fact, the game is now um, being tested by the physician at, uh, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma in his practice. And they just uh, reported uh, last week uh, we had a design. We we had a design review, um, uh, it to try and decide whether we were ready to go from prototype to pilot. So that's that's the way it works. So so they they you usually tell the patients to contact where they are in the health system, or do you have like a centralized innovation space, or how did uh, it concretely go? They contacted their physician in Oklahoma with the idea, and he said, "Oh, you really, you know, we're part of this collaborative chronic care network. Why don't you contact the C3N team?" And he put them in contact with us, and then our team, one of our research assistants, uh, started working with the team to help them bring them into this process that I'm showing. So this is this would be like an innovation. Um... It, it's a system that physicians can use that is a resource, but and and so in a way they sent the patients away, <laughs> but they were still in a system. Or yeah, well they connected the patient to this to us so that we could help them develop the idea, and then they the patient started using it in in their local system, which was the easy place for them to use it because they could go there, go physically there, and then as but. The central system, the C3N system, uh, we they present at our design review meetings and uh, can participate. So lead users in your systems, they are very active, but you keep them in the system. Would you say there is a risk that that people, patients, go and do things by themselves, um, disrupt? Uh, in fact, system? we have yeah. So we have had that experience where we've had patients uh, uh, come with an idea uh, and uh, uh, in fact uh, they uh, they've used the system uh, they've tried out an idea with other patients that uh, you know the other patients really reacted strongly against it and so uh, that person, uh, those people, the the idea stopped getting developed. The small scale testing, with a lot of awareness and transparency, allows that kind of risk to be managed. If there's a medical intervention that's going to be undertaken, obviously the care the physicians would be involved. But if, uh, in this case, it was uh, one of the patients had an idea about uh, mentoring. Um, but uh, she really hadn't thought it out very well, and it was uh, uh, it didn't have the experience to do it, and so the other patients didn't find it. The patients that she was working with and trying her idea out on didn't find it useful, and so she stopped developing it. So finishing off, thank you very much. Uh, what would you say if you were? What What do you love the most with your work with within the C3N, and what What do you what do you love most with it? Well, the thing that I find most exciting about this is that uh, it's a way for people to participate and uh, to dream a little bit about how they can make a contribution. Uh, we, as the people who run the C3N, we get a, a lot of excitement out of uh, helping other people um, 
empowering people to to make changes and to try out new ideas and to providing a system that enables them to do that it's extremely exciting so thank you very much peter mergolis for being with us thank you. so we have uh, the hashtag that for for that continues on twitter we have a linkedin group which you can find by searching design for better health or design for better health uh, please do not forget that we have three more uh, uh, lunch webinars this uh, term and uh, they are english they are swedish uh, speaking webinars so if you ha are a swede who have signed up using the english speaking signing up technology you will have to go into the swedish technology to sign up for the last three ones so that's why i I especially remind our um, bilingual uh, audience. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very Again. much for having me. I really appreciate it. Welcome back. Okay, bye-bye.